On this episode of Game Ball NFL Endzone, we're going to recap everything that happened with the top four matchups in Week 13. And in our second segment, we're going to talk about the Green Bay Packers firing of head coach Mike McCarty after going 4-7-1 and one on the season. And also we'll discuss the incident involving running back Kareem Hunt. So once again, did the NFL drop the ball on this one? And then also, who lost worse, the Kansas City Chiefs or the NFL? And coming up in our third segment, Week 14 is right around the corner, so we're going to give you the top four matchups to keep your eye out on. It's Game Ball NFL End Zone, and it starts now. What's happening, everyone? Welcome to Game Ball NFL End Zone, where the football season never ends. I'm Marcus Young, Genius Jenkins. It's your boy, Michael Riley. And of course, we're going to hold it down for our brother, Luke Hartnett, who couldn't be here with us once again. So you already know, we got his predictions to the top four matches of Week 14 on deck as well, coming up later in the episode. But for now, we're going to recap the top four matchups that we discussed last week. That was Week 13, starting with the Denver Broncos and a big win over the Cincinnati Bengals by a score of 24 to 10. Uh, secondly, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs in their first game uh, without Kareem Hunt. Um, a big win. Not really surprised, though, however, and we'll talk about this uh, here shortly. Not really surprised that it was a close matchup, being that the Kansas City Chiefs and the Oakland Raiders usually is a pretty good matchup. And it did not disappoint as well. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings, the New England Patriots, Patriots handling business, doing what they do best, and that's win football games. Uh, 24 to 10, they would win over Minnesota. Two games in the 24 10. I'm glad you pointed that out. <laughs> that is a fact. And then also, uh, we'll talk about this also briefly, um, shortly as well. Uh, the Los Angeles Chargers, another impressive win, 33 to 30. They would win over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, referring back to the Kansas City Chiefs, they were on the road in Oakland, 40 to 33. Patrick Mahomes played extremely well. Uh, they still put up 40 points against the Oakland Raiders. The defense is still an enigma because they allowed the Raiders and, and a not-so-great offense put up 33 points on you. But, of course, most notably, there's no Kareem Hunt. And mm -hmm. that versatility was definitely missing in this one. Patrick Mahomes threw for four touchdowns. But how was Kansas City able to hang on and get this win on the road? Well, they had to grind it out. And due to the Kareem Hunt situation, it was unfortunate. It caught everybody off guard. And because uh, Kareem Hunt is a hell of a time and talent and one dynamic player that you really had to prepare for, especially coming out of the backfield. I ain't got nothing against uh, Spencer Ware. He's a good player, but he's not Kareem Hunt due to our circumstances. We'll talk about that in the next segment uh, led to his release. It showed to where they was really exposed in Oakland. Uh, was close a game at the one point. They was down by three points, but it's the Oakland Raiders. Penalties, penalties, <laughs> penalties kill Oakland Raiders' chances to win that game. They played a great game, but it was just the minor mistakes that cost them. And also, Patrick Mahomes kept doing Patrick Mahomes, but at some point, you're going to have to rely on the running game. You're going to have to be balanced going to the playoff football because now no more Kareem Hunt. Teams is going to start to come and play uh, play physical. They're going to be like, okay, you have not have him no more due to the circumstances. So that's really going to make your offense one dimensional. It's got That's going to play other teams' defenses as favorites, especially with the Baltimore Ravens coming to town this week. And we'll talk about that on the third segment. So, uh, 
it showed, and I'm going to say most of it for the second segment, the Chiefs did what they did, but they have to be careful because they're the number one seed. And they got New England staring down. If New England wins and Kansas City lose one of these three tough games, their home field advantage is gone because New England has the tiebreaker of the Chiefs for a home field advantage. And right now, New England is playing New England football. Right and on time. This, right on time, especially this time of year, playoff football. So you have to win out the rest of the games to have home field advantage. You cannot sleep. So overall, the Chiefs got the win, and we'll break down the matchup uh, in their third segment. You can definitely tell Kansas City was missing something. You can, they basically looked like a finely cooked dish that was missing an ingredient to make it a great dish. And that's what it looked like. You can definitely tell in a lot of ways, though, they were kind of shook up because that other option. Kareem Hunt rushed for 824 yards on a year. He has touchdowns, receiving, and rushing. So he was like an all-purpose running back for them, and to not have that. And like you said, not to take away from Spencer Ware, because back in 2017, he was fourth among running backs in yards per carry. So, I mean, it's not like he's not a good running back by all. I mean, he's not as athletic and agile as Kareem Hunt. He's somebody that can muscle in some yards for you, and he's a solid back, but he's just not Kareem Hunt. And you can tell by the Kareem Hunt incident that it's the distraction. Absolutely. And how would they handle it going forward? We won't know, but we'll see what the Kansas City Chiefs are made of going forward. But, I mean, this is where the Chiefs not only have a head coach, but they also have a mentor in Andy Reid, someone who is a player's coach. How will he, he gather his troops, like you just said? We'll find out, and we'll talk about that Ravens matchup in uh, the third segment. Um, the Los Angeles Chargers continue to impress. I, I call them the, the stepbrother of the two Los Angeles teams because the Chargers, they, they have three losses, but they're just as talented as times, and they, and they showed that against Pittsburgh. They would come up big with a win, 33-30, to 30, uh, in this matchup. How were the Chargers able to get it done against a tough Pittsburgh team? I'll go to that, but how did Pittsburgh blow a 16-point lead? Another question is, with the way the season has gone, do you think that Mike Tomlin could potentially be in a hot seat at the end of the season? No. No? Because okay. uh, Mike Tomlin is a good coach, and he keeps uh, he keeps winning. That's what keeps his job. But he has to keep – he has to disciplinary that locker room because that locker room is dysfunctional. And we saw that. No Le'Veon Bell and everybody's blowing up. So we'll have to see about the Pittsburgh Steelers. They'll make the playoffs, but they're not going to go far. So uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers had a 16-point lead. The offense was going. The defense was – uh, playing good, getting turnovers, and uh, playing good football. But in the second, but starting in, towards the second quarter, in the second half, of uh, uh, when the Chargers score, unfortunately, uh, they didn't call that false start against that right tackle that led to the touchdown. But that's here or there. When they was at the Chargers' red end zone at the goal line, why did? Ben throw that LFI stupid interception. Yeah. And Derrick James, their rookie, who I said was balling and can make plays, he made that play. The interception, and that's what led to the Chargers having the ball. In the second half, the Chargers were able to make good adjustments, and the coach called them out. Basically, it's like, if y'all keep play like this, we might as well just pack up and go home. So which Chargers are we going to play? And that's exactly what it took to need. The way it started was that touchdown and the two-point conversion. Well, a luckily touchdown caught by Allen, which the two crash dummies was going for the same for interception because uh, Joe Hayden had an interception and Marty Burns hit him, knocked the, his teammate the ball out of his hands, and Allen was there and was like, thank you, touchdown. And the Tony O'Gay scored that two-point conversion. Then the defense went three and out. Then also that punt return for the touchdown and another two-point conversion. So that was a momentum changer. Then the Chargers had a 24-yard run for a 24 or 33-yard run for the touchdown by the rookie out of Northwestern State, Jackson, and kicked the extra point. And the charge and the Pittsburgh Steelers they score a touchdown 
and get an extra point, but they scored too early instead of draining the clock out. That left the Chargers with the eternity of clock, especially against Phillip Rivers. You do not want to leave that kind of time with Phillip Rivers in three timeouts. And they got some play going, and they got the momentum going. And Pittsburgh Steelers, why didn't they adjust their defense? They was they kept to the same play, nickel blitz, uh, whatever blitz they call, and they always get burnt by that. Change it up. That's the uh, exact same time you always get beat, especially the Patriots, because you continue to run that same blitz package and it keeps on hurting you. So they keep on doing that. Also, you have three offside penalties. Three. And one of them, the kicker missed. <laughs> and uh, encroachment. I'm like, you got to know when the ball is snapped. Then all of a sudden, another encroachment to where half their defensive players was on the line. Then they got the kicker to reset again. So he got his confidence. And when they kicking, they made the official, it was offsides, but this one counted. So the Chargers, and like I said last week, they are a sleeper in the AFC. So the Chargers has put the AFC conference on notice. We're here. And they still have a shot next Thursday night to win a division against their arch rivals, the Kansas City Chiefs. Perfect timing. Perfect timing for the Chargers to play football. So, overall, uh, dysfunctional, uh, bad management by the Pittsburgh Steelers. They didn't do what they need to do in the second half, and it showed. And Baltimore has still have a shot to win that division. We'll talk about that more later. And the Chargers, they just keep rolling. So, every team in the AFC needs to pay attention to the Chargers. They're no pushover either. They can ball. All right. That's going to do it for our first segment. Coming up in the second segment, we got a lot to talk about, starting with the Green Bay Packers and their firing of Coach Mike McCarty after a 4-7-1 season. And we'll also touch on that Kareem Hunt topic. Stick around. Game Ball NFL End Zone. We'll be back in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. We're just getting started. Welcome back to Game Ball NFL End Zone, where the football season never ends. Now, in the second topic, I got to ask you if this is a fair assessment of what have you done for me lately. And the reason why I say this, of course, we talked about it. The Green Bay Packers fired head coach Mike McCarty after going 4-7-1 um, on this season, even though the season has yet to end. But it's one of those things, okay, Mike McCarty got you a Super Bowl ring. Marvin Lewis is still in Cincinnati. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm just saying, what have you done for me lately? But it's not like Mike McCarty was a bad coach because, I mean, this 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 is the first legitimately bad year that they've had. I mean, they've been a playoff team consistently for the most part. I get it. This year was pretty rough, but at the same time, it's like, okay, we we making a change here. Marvin Lewis is still <laughs> he's still a head coach. What do you think about this firing of the uh, Mike McCarty by Green Bay? Though? I thought it was bad timing. If you're going to fire a coach where there's few games left of the season, let him finish out as the head coach. He deserved that much of that part. He has brought you the Super Bowl uh, title in a long time. I mean, I get it. It was a bad season for it. And you can start to see kind of dysfunctionality with Aaron Rodgers and the head coach because you want to build that relationship and trust. For instance, Tom Brady and Belichick, they might have some frictions, but they got that relationship and trust to where they can count on one another, and you hardly see that happen in New England. With other coaches as well, you can also tell that Andy Reid has started trying to build a trust relationship with Patrick Mahomes. And uh, you also have to take that into account, and you also have to take into account 
the front office didn't doing favors for uh, Mike McCarthy, uh, getting uh, all these players and coaches and try to do different schemes, but didn't work out. And also, they was plagued with injuries. So you have to look at the front office like they didn't do no justice for Mike McCarthy or Aaron Rodgers either. You ha also have to put the blame on Aaron Rodgers as well. At times, he's trying to make a play out of something out of nothing, and it's also costing him to get an injury. Instead of taking what defense gives you, live another down with another day, throw check downs and all that. I understand you want to hit the home run hits, but at the same time, you got to take what the defense gives you. And the defense has been anemic for the last few years, and you really show this year. And you can see the last of Clay Matthews playing for the Packers. After this year, he's gone. He hasn't been the same since that injury uh, like he once was when his rookie year and the year that they won the Super Bowl. That's what Clay Matthews was dominant. So uh, it's just a friction, everything gone bad. I feel like why, and you brought that up too, how come Marvin Lewis is still having a job at Cincinnati as 16 years hasn't won a playoff game, but Mike McCarthy brought you a Super Bowl and he gets fired before the end of the season. So I feel like they did him wrong there. I mean, if you're going to fire a coach and was some way expected to happen, let him finish as the head coach of the season. So that makes your organization look bad by firing him before the season is even over with. You only have about, boy, four to five games left of the season. That is just bad business right there. And that's where the Green Bay Packers dropped the ball. And you can start seeing coaches be like, okay, that's kind of a red flag there. I don't mm -hmm. know if I really want to go there. There's also been offense coordinator Josh McDaniels of the Patriots could potentially go to the Packers, but I don't think he's going due to how he handled with the coach situation last year. So it's going to be some uh, candidates out there for the job who is well qualified we don't know but i think cleveland should go after mike mccarthy or if the Bengals are smart enough let marvin lewis go and hire mike mccarthy as the head coach of the cincinnati Bengals. so we don't know what's going to go on from there but all i know is mike mccarthy deserves some blame but he didn't deserve this at all. He could at least finish out the season on a high note. Then y'all could have had a meeting. The season was over. Then you could have parted ways. It would look a little bit better. But no, you had to act now and all that. This is, was a slap in the face. It was disrespectful to Mike McCarthy. You basically spit in his face, gave him the finger and said, F you, we're done with you. Instead, let you finish out the season. And I thought that was wrong and disrespectful by the Packers. I agree. I mean, I think he touched on everything with that one. Um, I think this really did take everyone by surprise. I know I was surprised. When I, I was, was too. News that he was fired. So after he made a statement about next game, cutthroat like that. And that's the National Football League. Um, now, this this topic in particular, obviously, for a lot of people, will be sensitive in a lot of ways. And of course, we know about domestic violence and how much it's been an issue in the National Football League and how a lot of instances have kind of been swept under the rug and the way that the National Football League reacts to these things and, and, and how they handle things accordingly. And this this is among that. And this is also being kind of compared to the Ray, uh, Ray Rice situation. And we all we remember what happened with that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we've, we've, we've all seen the video. Um, at least I would thank most of you out there watching this. If you haven't, you can YouTube it. You can Google it. You can you can watch it. It's everywhere. Yes. Um, the question is in regards to that. Um, the first question would be, did the NFL drop the ball in handling this situation? Because it was first addressed months ago. So it's not like this is new and nobody knew about it. But maybe is it because the Kansas City Chiefs and at least the information that was given to them at that time, they kind of handled it but they didn't investigate further into it. Yes, they dropped the ball. This is the second time they dropped the ball. One with the Ray Rice situation. The, it was egregious, that Ray Rice situation. And also, there was a video out there, and the NFL said we could not get a copy of it. 
if TMC got a copy of it, how come you can't get a copy of it? That is the lamest excuse on the NFL's part saying I can't get a copy. Of course you could get a copy of that. You're the NFL. You're the National Football League. And it involves one of your employees. Exactly. You could have paid somebody for that information as well. If TMZ could do it, why can't you? That's something I don't get. And that's a baloney excuse and a lie in a way to me. And they did drop the ball the second uh, second time on this incident. This incident happened months ago. And, court, and you did not reach out to Kareem Hunt about it. And that's what he said the interview that he did the couple days later after the video was out. He said he admitted he was wrong. And the lady asked him, did the NFL reach you out, reach out to you about it? He said, no, I haven't heard a word from the NFL. So that tells you right there, they dropped, really dropped the ball on this. And because we're sensitive into, sensitive into this domestic violence, violence issue nowadays, you're going to start ha really having an uproar through all organizations, uh, domestic violence uh, organizations, women's rights, and so on and so on. It's going to start coming hard to the NFL of handling this stuff. Now, you hire a female uh, executive, wherever that position is, to try to handle this issue. You think you can get it right, but you got it wrong again. And if TMZ could get the video again with this issue, how come you can't get the video? That is the lamest excuse. You need to hire more female uh, workers that handle this issue, like domestic violence issue, like uh, judges or lawyers or some type in that field to be like on the staff to be like do their due diligence investigation because if something like this comes out, you need to do a thorough inf uh, investigation to where, okay, we're going to look at this more because this happened in February. Why did you not try to get your hands on it? Why did you not try to call the police more and get your hands on it? You need to step up and do better in this domestic violence issues. Now with Kareem Hunt, he was in the wrong for that. The woman started, yes. But this ain't back in, the, back in the day to where we were growing up. Don't let nobody hit you. It doesn't matter if it's a woman. But now we live in a different world. You can't do that anymore. And now the spotlight is on you. Back in the day, we wouldn't know about this because there was no cameras, no YouTube, no Facebook, no Twitter, no TMZ to get videos out there like this. You had to physically be there. But now we live in a different time frame to where... Every camera is at every corner of somewhere. Uh, I could possibly cell phones. Exactly, okay. you could possibly go in a public restroom to take a lonely dump. There's a camera somewhere hiding. I'm just using that example. I'm just saying. I mean, but there's yeah. some potential truth to that. Now, yeah. I mean, but uh, Kareem Hunt was in a wrong. He knew better. Was alcohol and maybe some drugs involved in it? Could be. I don't know. It was a late. In the morning, in the evening of that incident that happened, and his friends was trying to restrain him for going after her. You should have just listened to your boys, like, dude, this is this ain't worth it. This ain't it. I'm like, just let it go. And the, every camera is on you, especially if you're an African American professional athlete. They're definitely looking at you. For you to screw up and all that. that. A lot of truth to Change that. Change for LeBron James. LeBron James does not put himself in this situation because he surrounded his he surrounds himself with good people. If that was to happen, he'll cut them off real quick. We don't tolerate that. So players in the NFL should look at to other players in sports, especially by racial players, looking at to, for examples like LeBron James, how he goes about handling business and some other ethnic, ethnicity athletes as well. So uh, this, is a, this is a blow for the NFL again, and this is a bigger blow for the Chiefs because they trusted 
Kareem Hunt. They had his back. They went out and told the NFL, this what happened, this what happened. He's our guy, and nothing happened. They love Kareem Hunt like they was their own son. They let this filthy, dirty, stinking draws. And this is how you do it. You basically lost your trust with Kansas City. Your career in Kansas City is over. But going forward, would teams trust him again? I don't know. We don't know about that. So you got to earn a lot of people's trust to try to get back in the football sure, league. Sure. But this is, wasn't egregious as the Ray Rice was. Not even close, but still. But still, you was in the wrong. You knew better. You should have listened to your friends that were good people that was trying to restrain, like, dude, calm down. This ain't worth it. And this co uh, cost you potential a bigger contract due to the end of your rookie contract. And he was a hell of a talent that running back. And he could he was on pace to get a contract extension. Now he blew it. So he has to start from the ground up and work his way up. And he has to do a lot of apologizing. He has to apologize to the Chiefs. He has to apologize to his family and friends. He also has to apologize to the female that he assaulted. Technically, he did everything but apologize to the female. Actually. So now you got to do some research and soul searching. How can you handle this better? And you got a lot of making up to do. And now if I were him, I would reach out to the domestic violence group and situations and start to go into that community and try to build yourself better. But you know who really looks better in this? And I'm going to go there. Colin Kaepernick looks a lot better than this uh, to what the NFL does. And the reason why I say that, because you have the NFL that uh, get, uh, that will tolerate certain situations, like for instance, call it Kaepernick taking a knee, no, a I, peaceful I protest, going. and he's out of the league. But you have players with domestic violence incidents and disputes that still are in the league that have a job. There's a few, but how come Colin Kaepernick does not have a job? He does not have no off the field issues, no domestic violence issues. He just has a peaceful protest and still has a job. That's just something that. Uh, people need to keep an eye on, and it's a very alarming going forward. So the NFL really looks bad at this, and they dropped the ball again, but the Kansas City Chiefs really look bad because they were lied to about it. And in NFL, if they tell you something that player said, still do an investigation. You still go out and be like, okay, I'm going to still do a thorough investigation. And that's exactly what I was going to say. Go ahead and continue. So what was your – take on it no i agree the nfl dropped the ball because here, here's the thing with the national football league they are notorious for sweeping a lot of things under the table or a lot of the rug because i think roger goodell is more concerned about his brand that's what i really think it comes down to he's more concerned about losing money he's more concerned about losing his brand more than anything obviously if the kansas city chiefs knew about it and it was reported they knew about it. There's no excuse for it. Mm -hmm. The Kansas City Chiefs, like you mentioned, they also dropped the ball. They're no better. Yes, I understand you trust and, and you respect them for that. But it's also we could say that, yes, he broke the trust of the Kansas City Chiefs. But like you mentioned, the Kansas City Chiefs should have also looked into it a little bit further. And I think maybe another result could have happened. But at the same time, even after if, even if they would have did that after they asked Kareem Hunt what happened, he probably would have been released a lot sooner. Could they have also been protecting a strong asset on their behalf with Kareem Hunt? Because Kareem Hunt, he has the potential to be, he has Hall of Fame talent written all over him. He's, he's a once in a generation running back. Now, what, what's going back on your topics, here's where I start with it. This could have been way worse then what really could have happened? Imagine if no one was there to restrain him. Oh, yeah. Kareem Hunt could actually be in prison right now facing big-time charges, and his career right now could be over. That's the blessing of it. We still don't know what's yet to come. The NFL now is forced to do, to do, re to do research and an investigation because they have no choice because they're put on blast. Now they're going to have to do it. What is going to come down for the National Football League at this point? Are there charges that are still going to be filed? This could have been way worse. If there was no one there to stop him, 
The thing that I saw is when he shoved her. But but here's the thing that disappointed me about Kareem Hunt. This girl was out your apartment. Man, close that door on that female. Peace. Bye. Cloud. I'm going to go Kick back and rocks. do me. Basically. And, I, and I'm not saying anything. I'm not passing judgment on Kareem Hunt at all. I'm not passing no judgment, nor am I giving him a pass for what he did. This is something that does happen. But I will say that he had more control over the situation than what he did. He could have walked away. He shoved her. But I think the icing on the cake is when he kicked her. Yeah. To me, that's when he knew. I think he knew. He can't say that. Oh, the, the thing that I, I was kind of disappointed in is like, I understand that you and I, I believe he is remorseful for what he did. Maybe I'll get some backlash for saying that. But at the same time is I feel like. The reason why he <coughs> lied to the Chiefs is because he knew if they found out, he was done. I mean, go back to your point. If he would have told the truth from the get-go, I think the Chiefs would not release him. I think they would suspend him. Pay for the rest of the year. And, or- and all that and still be part of the team. If he was truthful, because if you're true, yes, you're going to get in trouble. But I'd rather be truthful than lie than make it look worse. So now you lied and make them look worse. If I was the Chiefs, I would have done more investigation to where that he could be potential lying. Also, give him a lie detector test. Make him do the lie detector test. You lie. If you pass this lie detector test, I'm going to ask you again. If you pass it, I'll believe you. So there could be a different ways that NFL could have handled it. And the Chiefs could have had it, but the NFL dropped the bigger ball. If they, like you said, if the Chiefs got information from it, why didn't you jump on that? This was in February. This was like eight, nine months ago that this happened. This happened after the Patriots and Eagles Super Bowl. That's when it happened. So why, why now? Why act on it now? And NFL, there's no excuse for it. They're only acting because they have to do it. That's the thing. I'm like, this is really starting to look bad for NFL. You start half a lot of things to for NFL. If they don't shape up quick and act now to be better, it could get only worse for the NFL going forward. I'm just saying. It seems like they're more swifter depending on what it is. But I will, I will say this, though. I'm going to keep it 100% honest. The blessing in this is that Kareem Hunt is a young man. He's only 25 years old. He has a lot of life left to live. He has a lot of potential football left to be played. It's already been noted that even though he's on waivers, no one's going to claim him. After multiple sources, multiple GMs have been interviewed, nobody's going to claim him off of waivers. So he's going to become a restricted free agent. He's already cleared waivers as of today. He cleared waivers. So, so nobody's going to claim him. I think what's going to happen is they're going to wait for the NFL to do his investigation or and, what have you. And laid their suspension as well. Right. And then some, somebody's going to pick him up. And I don't see why not. Like I said, I'm not passing judgment. This is a young man that made a terrible, terrible, terrible decision. And I think he has an opportunity to realize as a young man that you could throw your career away just like that. And also, you have to get Kareem Hunt credit. He wanted to do this interview. Yes, he chose. He, he yes. reached out to the ESPN reporter who does a phenomenal job. He reached Lisa out Salter. to her. He's like, I want to do this now. Let's do it now. You have to give him credit for that. And I'm going to bring this up. Joe Mixon for that punch that he had. He knocked out a girl. I'm not passing judgment on that, but... You can say, luckily, it happened before he got into the NFL. So that happened before he got to the NFL. He's remorseful for it. And that was a egregious punch that he did to her. But it wasn't a Ray Rice one, the egregious one that he had. So, And Ray Rice never recovered from that. And the NFL has to do better. They have to do better with the domestic violence issues or you're going to have a lot of lawsuits and a lot of organizations coming out your head. It can only get ugly. So deal with it now and try to handle it and hire some people that handle this situation. You need to hire more female leaders to handle domestic violence issue that investigated, that struggle with it, that's been through domestic violence. So the NFL needs to reach out more to female leaders. In my opinion, female leaders need to step up in the NFL, and female leaders need to be hired now. I, I, I want to say this one last thing, though. I can't see nobody not signing Kareem Hunt, and I'm not saying this because he's a talent. 
If you have guys like Adam Jones, I'm not, I'm, and I'm not putting them on blast, but you got guys like Adam Padman Jones, drugs, violence, everything, multiple, multiple, multiple chances. You have a guy that, under drunk driving, killed someone, didn't get no punishment by the National Football League, and he still had a job. I can't see why somebody's not going to pick him up. The thing is, domestic violence to me is just one small topic that the NFL has dealing with. They got drugs. They got all kinds of other issues that they're dealing with. I think more than anything, Roger Goodell, which I doubt he's going to ever do, is, yeah, there does have to be a lot of different policies in place that if you're a professional, he is, first of all, it's not going to be Roger Goodell that cleans up the National Football League. It's going to be way long after he's gone. It's going to call for people to make, basically, he has no choice but to step down. When that happens, I have no idea. And like I said, I'm not passing judgment on the incident at all. I'm not passing judgment We're on that We're not condoning it. We're just saying. Right. But I'm, I'm still not passing judgment on Kareem Hunt. I'm not passing judgment on the situation. It's, it's an unfortunate situation. And like I said, I wish the best for this young man. Like I said, he's still young. He's still a growing man. And, and I pray that he learns from this situation. And I, I hope he does, like you said, reach out to the domestic violence and, and, and women's shelters and, and show his seriousness for not just to get established back into the National Football League, but just to show that he's willing to grow and mature from this as well. And he does. And he he's able to learn from this. And I, I, I was getting ready to say is. America is a land of second chances. Absolutely. If he gets a second chance, he has to make the most of it. Yes. Whenever that happens, I don't know. But right now, he just need to focus on him being the better person that he is and going out to communities and organizations with women that dealt with domestic violence. Get some tips, learning tips, and be mentored by those female leaders and organizations as the NFL they need to hire some of those in their office like right now or else this issue if they drop the ball again strike three it could be over I hope to tell you the truth I hope he does find some mentorship because like I said he's a talented young man and he still potentially has a future and I, I really hope that he does have another chance like I said like like you said like I think everybody deserves a second chance regardless of what they did you know what I'm saying I know we're gonna have people out there on the internet that's going to shame them. And this, this, that's the society that we live in. It's social media. It's YouTube. We, we pass judgments even though none of us are perfect out there. We're going we're gonna to quickly pass judgment, shame them, and, and, and throw, them in, throw them in the depths of, of, of you know what. But what I'm saying is I hope at the end of the day he does get a second chance. But I hope that he does take the time and finds a, a, a better group of people to surround himself with. And I hope someone also reaches out to him, them, excuse me, to him and he also does the same. And to go there about social media, I was reading some comments because there was some uh, people with mixed feelings that the woman started first and this, this and that. But there's still no excuse as males. We want to we our pride. That's what matters to us. Males is pride. But at the end of the day, you got to check your pride and learn to walk away from certain situations because now the cameras out on you and you're a black athlete. They want something to write about you. Just mm -hmm. like, even though we're uh, for our podcast to show, we're not big yet, but we're still out there and we have to think about what we're doing or else we're going to get, uh, or else that could have been one of us. So for us, we got to look at like this situation, like we got to watch what we say now because we're in that era to where everything's everywhere. Even though we're not big yet, but we're still coming on, but we still got to watch what we do. Still got to carry yourself. Exactly. I agree with that. Um, would you agree that we pretty much answered the question of who lost worse in this case between the Chiefs and the NFL? Yeah, who, yeah looks worse, yes. Man. I think we did. Absolutely. And, um, and for, for the show that we do, we don't back it down for nothing. If something happens, we'll talk about it. We'll 100%. brutally honest opinion. We'll talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, I do want to say this one thing. I wish Kareem Hunt the best. And not just because I'm a Chiefs fan, but like I said, I as, really hope that he turns his As a he, human. As yes. A, and I mean, I, I, I do hope that he does uh, have an opportunity to redeem himself and he makes the most of it. And we don't like talking about this stuff. Because all we do is want to talk about football, football, this yes. and this and that. But 
issues like this force us to talk about stuff like that. And we'll talk about in the next segment how would the Chiefs bounce from this going forward. All right. And that's going to do it for our second segment. Moving on to the third one. Week 14 is just days away. And we got the top four matches. Speaking of the Kansas City Chiefs, we'll talk about their matchup with the Baltimore Ravens as well as three other top or three matches for you to keep your eyes out on. We're still going. It's Game Ball NFL End Zone. We'll be back. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Back to Game Ball NFL End Zone. Now it is almost week 14 in the National Football League, and we got the top four matchups for you to keep your eyes out on this coming weekend. Of course, starting with the Kansas City Chiefs um, attempting in their second week in a row to move on from the Kareem Hunt incident. Uh, they're taking on the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Mike, what do you like about this matchup? Well, how will Kansas City respond uh, going forward without Kareem Hunt? And they're playing at home against Baltimore. But Baltimore is hungry because they know what's at front of them. That last spot in the wild card playoffs and also a potential division win if the Pittsburgh Steelers keep losing. So they know what's at front. Uh, with Lamar Jackson, he's only going to get better. But he's playing good ball right now. They're just managing the game for him, not doing anything crazy. Uh, he's going to get better in the passing game. But the running game is phenomenal. But... If he can improve on his mechanics a little bit, he could be a good player, maybe a great player going forward now in the future. So for the Kansas City Chiefs, they have to somehow establish the running game because the Baltimore Ravens is top five defense in the NFL, and they're going to play physical football, especially Terrell Suggs, and this time of career, still balling. Yep. T-sizzle. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be – the. Chiefs offensive line against the Ravens defensive line. Who's going to win that battle? Because we all know the Ravens love hunting out young quarterbacks. Well, under the young pretty boy quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, they love to hunt down. I mean, they're going to throw every pressure at him. So the Chiefs offense has to play great in this game or else they'll lose. They've got, they got to get their running game going. And Absolutely. the uh, pass game. Patrick Mahomes can't do that launching on uh, holding the ball because this is the Baltimore Ravens defense we're talking about. They get after the quarterback. So you got to get rid of the ball quick. Got to get Tyreek Hill going. Also, you got to get Travis Kelsey going. And for Baltimore, study the tapes of the Patriots and the Rams, how they won against the Chiefs. Patriots had a lot of success against Travis Kelsey than what the Rams did. They just beat him up at the line of scrimmage. If you beat him up, cost him up his routes. Because Tyreek Hill, he's going to do this thing. But the focus is if you take Travis Kelsey, that forces Patrick Mahomes to look elsewhere to where he's not uncomfortable. And offense, uh, keep doing what you're doing and let Lamar Jackson grow. And the Chiefs defense is going to have a tough time stopping him this week. Because we all know once the pressure comes, he can take off quick for first down. So mm -hmm. it'll be an interesting matchup to see, but it's going to be a good one. Absolutely. I strongly agree with that one. Now, the second matchup, the Indianapolis Colts taking on the Houston Texans. The Indianapolis Colts, in a, in a, a weird defeat, they lost 6 to nothing against the Jacksonville Jaguars. How do they bounce back against the Texans? Well, they're going to have to. Uh, otherwise, they're going to kiss their playoff hopes goodbye because they're still in the hunt. So for uh, they have to go back to the drawing board. They have to figure out what they can do very offensively and defensively because Texans is on a roll, nine-game winning streak. So if they want to beat the Texans, they have to be aggressive offensively, score touchdowns, not field goals, and defense has to play great. 
for the Texas offense, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep the running game going. Don't change anything better. Be consistent in the pass game with Deshaun Watson defense. Just keep playing good defense. If you can do that, you can win games. All right. Indianapolis looking to bounce back from an awkward loss against the Texans. The Philadelphia Eagles will be taking on the Dallas Cowboys, who've been playing well as of late. We know they went on Thanksgiving against the Washington Redskins. Uh, Saints. Or excuse me, the New Orleans Saints. 13 to 10 was that score. Um, Looking to keep that streak going against the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, what do you like about this matchup between the Eagles and the Cowboys? Well, the Eagles had a heartbreak loss at home against the Dallas Cowboys. If they win the Monday night matchup, they'll have to win to keep the division alive because the NFC East is the weakest division in the NFL. Their season could still be over, but if they win against the Washington Redskins, if they win against the Dallas Cowboys, they'll be in the driver's seat for first place. So anybody can win that division. It's going to come down to can they uh, make enough plays offensively, defensively. So if they can make enough plays in that category, still win. And the Dallas Cowboys, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'll give you a little bit of credit. Not a lot, just a little bit. But we all know the Dallas Cowboys can screw up at some point. When that black cat comes out and curse you, they'll drop the ball. It always happens, but with the Dallas Cowboys, just play good defense and not screw up offensively with the play calling. That's all you can do. All right, the Eagles looking to keep their good football uh, streak going against the Philadelphia Eagles. In the fourth and final matchup, the Seattle Seahawks against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, we know the Vikings coming off of that tough loss to the New England Patriots where I scored 24 to 10. Um, how do they bounce back against Seattle? They're going to have to because right now with that loss, that puts Seattle in their spot in the wild card playoff. And this is the game they need to have to continue their playoff hopes alive. They just offensively, Kirk Cousins, uh, I don't think he's a franchise quarterback, in my opinion. I think he's a little bit overrated. He's a good quarterback, but not a franchise quarterback, because a franchise quarterback will take you to higher limits. So you have to go back to the drawing board offensively and find out what mistakes that were made to get better defensively. You had him the first part, but once the Patriots start rolling, they don't look bad. So what can you do defensively to stop Seattle Seahawks offense? And the Seattle Seahawks, I would like I said last week in the show yesterday, they are potential sleepers. They can beat anybody if they get into the playoffs. If the Seattle Seahawks get into the playoffs, I will be scared of them right now because they are playing some good football. And they finally got back to the running game. They got a three-headed monster running backs that, that can play. And also the passing game, and Tyler Lockett is playing at a high level this year at the receiver spot. I mean, he can play, but this year he's taking this game up to another level, balling and making it easier for Russell Wilson. Also, the other receivers is making it easier for him as well. And the offensive lineman is doing a lot better job than what he did at past times. And that defense... Bobby uh, Wagner taking the pick six. Woo! He still got some wheels left in him, so I'm excited for this matchup. All right, and that's going to take us to the predictions part of the podcast, starting with the Chiefs and the Ravens. Who do you, who do you and Luke got? Excuse me. Luke has the Kansas City Chiefs women. I'm going to go out on them. If I lose, I'm going to admit my wrongs. I'm going with the Baltimore Ravens to win. I'm going with the upset. And the reason why I say this is because a lot of distraction is going with the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. They will hit blindsided, and it plays the Baltimore Ravens' favorite because nobody is talking about them right now, the way they're winning and how they're playing good defense. And I just feel like – and Baltimore Ravens has won in Arrowhead before. At past times, they know how to win. So going forward, I just feel like Baltimore Ravens has something to play for. They're playing for to keep that wild card spot in the playoffs. They're playing for a divisional win potentially. So I'm just going with a wide note, and my gut feeling tells me the Baltimore Ravens will get a close win. I said the Baltimore Ravens went 23-20 to 20 at Arrowhead over the Chiefs. Let's see a score like that. Um, I'm going to say I like Kansas City, and here's why. 
they have a better opportunity to prepare. They were blindsided this past week with the whole Kareem Hunt situation. Now you have an opportunity now to kind of adjust a week later. They, they know they don't have Kareem Hunt. So that gives an opportunity for Spencer Ware to kind of be reacclimated to the lineup, have some more preparation. And I think, once again, of course they don't have a, an athletic running back, but they do have two running backs now. They, they brought in a second one that they can kind of pound the football more. So it's not like they have they, they do have a, sort of a weakness, but at the same time, it's also Joey Flacco. Which Joey Flacco is going to show up? Actually, Lamar Jackson. Or, excuse started. me, Lamar Jackson. Excuse me. But... I, I still don't see a defense that is going to be able to stop Kansas City from scoring. Do I think it's going to be close? I can see that. But I think <coughs> Kansas City will find a way to get it done at home. Um, like, like I said, they have this week, there's, there's no surprises. They had an opportunity to adjust offensively as well as prepare for the Baltimore Ravens. I think they'll be back to, uh, I think they'll be fine this week. I think they'll win by a score. I say 35, 35-21, I got Kansas City. And uh, also, I picked the Baltimore Ravens to win is because. That without Kareem Hunt in that situation, that forces the Chiefs to be a one-dimensional offense. That one-dimensional offense could have cost them against Oakland, but it didn't because the Raiders, Raiders will make Raiders mistakes, but this is the Ravens we're talking about. They don't make mistakes like that. If the, uh, When they force teams to make them, despite their record, they can ball. When other teams make a mistake like that, Baltimore Ravens capitalize on it and jump on it and never look back. So I see this week, this could be a down week for the Chiefs. I can see that, but I mean, I'm, I'm just going with the fact that they actually had a week to prepare for Spencer where they have an opportunity to, to make some plays to his, to his abilities. And I just feel like this was kind of like a thrown off week. Yeah, we know the Raiders and the Chiefs. Let's be honest. That's always going to be a good matchup. I don't care if the Ravens or the, the Oakland Raiders didn't win a single football game. They're always going to make it interesting with the Chiefs, especially in Oakland. That's, that's a no brainer. And the Chiefs' next three games are tough. You got the Baltimore Ravens. Thursday night, you got the Chargers. And you're at Seattle, who is a hot team. Seattle is no sleepover either going there. So we'll see what the Chiefs made of, the, of these next three games. I would agree there. Um, like I said, I got the Kansas City Chiefs. Mike got the Ravens, and Luke got the Kansas City Chiefs. The second matchup, the Colts and the Texans. Who do y'all got? Luke got the Texans. I got the Texans as well. I just don't see them slowing down. They're on a winning streak. They're a team you going. It's just simple. And this will put the Colts' playoff hunts really in jeopardy. So keep it simple, sweet. Texans win 31-17. I'm going with the Texans. The Colts struggled against the Jaguars. Six to nothing. I like Houston. Third matchup, your boys. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles. So you got in this matchup. Luke has the Dallas Cowboys. It's easy leaning towards the Dallas Cowboys, but some tells me they're going to get cursed by that black cat and they're going to screw it up. So I'm going to roll with the Philadelphia Eagles to win at the Dallas Cowboys. It's going to be a slug fest, but I see them winning. 19 to 10, Philadelphia Eagles winning over the Dallas Cowboys. I'm going to say this, everybody watching this. I want you to comment on Facebook or YouTube if you thought that he was going to pick the, if you really thought that he was going to pick the Cowboys. I, I just, I just want to say, just, just to make it more interesting, who really thought that you was going to sway the way of the Cowboys? It's just who they are. You know they mess up every time when it comes to crunch time, they fold. I'm telling you, you and Stephen A, we got to find a way for y'all to link up and y'all can have a hate party for the Cowboys. I'm telling you, y'all can have a hate party, man. I, I'm telling you. I mean, if this were like a different culture type of Cowboys, okay. But Jason Garrett is still the coach, and Jerry Jones is still going to keep Jason Garrett, and that marriage will never end. If it ends, I'm in the hospital fall and pass by him and like, oh, but it's not going to end anytime soon. No, you want to trust the Dallas Cowboys? History repeats itself. They screw up. And that's why I say the Dallas Cowboys are a bad luck in the making because that black cat on Pet Cemetery will curse them. Dang that cat. Um, I'm going to go with the, the Dallas Cowboys offensively. Prescott's been playing well. Ezekiel Elliott has been playing well for the most part. I can see them getting it done. Um, 
But something tells me to go with Philly. I'm going to go with my heart on this one. I'm going to say Philadelphia beats Dallas. Fourth and final matchup, Minnesota looking to bounce back from that loss against the Patriots against the Seahawks. Who y'all got? Uh, where are they playing at? They are, I want to. I believe they're in Seattle. I believe Seattle. Exactly. Yes, I was going to say they're Exactly. Right That's why I'm going with the Seattle Seahawks school because when you travel to 12th Man Stadium, that crowd, Stadium. Ooh, Kirk Cousins is going to have an awful time. And I say their playoffs, it really be in jeopardy. I just don't see Seattle Seahawks losing another game, honestly. So, and at home too, that's when they're at their best is playing at home. I'm going to say Seattle Seahawks, better team at home, win a score of 31 to 20. And Luke has the Seahawks win as well. I second y'all. Um, I second the both of you. So I, I like the Seahawks as well. I think they'll play well at home. Just not, I just don't trust the Vikings right now. I don't trust Kirk Cousins. And Kirk know. Cousins, I don't trust. All right, and that's going to do it for this episode of Game Ball NFL End Zone. Social media, you can follow us at on Facebook, Game Ball College Kickoff slash Game Ball NFL End Zone. You can follow us at on Twitter, on our official Twitter page, GCK underscore GNFLE. You can also follow your boy on Twitter, all caps, at Game Ball underscore my NYKE. You can also email us at GCK.GNFLE. That's our email account. You can also follow us on our Instagram, GCK underscore GNFLE. You can also get our clothing line on our clothing line website at tokendesignstopeka.com slash Game Ball. We have hoodies. Workout gear, everything. Token Designs to Pick com slash Game Ball. That's T O K A N Designs to Pick com. That's Token, not Toucan, folks. Also, you can follow us at on our YouTube page. Hit that like button, subscribe. Your my left to your right, you like to your left, vice versa. Thumbs up, thumbs down. At GCK G N F L E T V. That's on our YouTube page. But when you subscribe, make sure you hit that notification button to get alerts and updates on our posting. I'm going to pass it on to you, my brother. All right. And as always, on Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, also YouTube channel coming soon, Instagram as well, Jovell Entertainment. That's capital J-O-V-E-L-L-E. Entertainment. Also for inquiries, Entertainment at gmail.com. You can't forget about our other brother, Luke Hartnett. He is part of his family as well. Always. Facebook, Instagram as Lou Hartnett, and on Twitter as Lou Hartnett, too, folks. I'm Michael Riley. I'm Marcus Young, Genius Jenkins. This is Game Ball NFL Inside, where the football season never ends. Peace. We are out, and see you next week.